Hello everyone, this is Amir from Audio Science Review. I have a review for you of this um, RCF speaker. If you haven't heard of the company, it's an Italian uh, company. And the model that I have is this uh, IRA Pro 5. It comes in 5 inch, this is the smallest one. And then there's, I think, six and a half, and then there's an eight inch model. Uh, you can go to their website, I haven't memorized their model numbers. But anyway, uh, this was requested by a couple of members to be tested. So I went ahead and bought it from uh, Amazon US and uh, surprisingly cheap for a powered studio monitor, uh, $149, including uh, shipping from Amazon. So. Hard to imagine how they make these speakers so cheap. It's so much stuff going on in them. Um, this is actually a rare uh, DSP speaker. Uh, it's bi amp, so all the signal processing for the uh, crossovers done digital domain, as is uh, some uh, correction uh, for the frequency response done there. So uh, usually the lower end uh, powered monitors that just have uh, analog crossover and no dsp so this have that be at, at this price range is quite remarkable um nice thing about a professional monitor is that it usually has xlr input and whenever you use powered uh, speakers i highly recommend using the xlr connection because you have multiple sources of power usually the speakers plugged in yet another outlet you have your computer and everything's got is at a different ground potential uh, with respect to safety uh uh, uh chassis ground so if you use the rca uh, you're really oops really inviting ground loops so xlr in my book is is quite necessary unless you're using some kind of desktop monitor where everything's plugged into where the computer is but in general you know try to use xlr and you know so get a deck with the uh, uh, xlr output uh, to drive it um not a whole lot else going on here the couple of uh, boundary uh, and the high frequency uh, correction over here I, I tend to never use those leave them at zero for both measurement and for equalization i do the eq and software is so much more powerful and flexible but to the extent you don't have eq capabilities you have a little bit of of, of control here um uh let's see what else i want to tell you um uh the uh all of almost every speaker on this i tell you otherwise is measured relative to the uh center of the twitter uh, sometimes the manufacturer will specify a different uh, acoustic center. I don't think they did, and even if they did, it would be so close to the uh, center of Twitter in such a small speaker that shouldn't matter. Um, it is front ported. You can see these classic dual eye ports in the front. Um, and uh, ports, if you don't know, allow you to have more extended low frequency response, which tends to be very necessary in this class of device. But they do have some drawbacks, and we'll get into that shortly. Um, it's a little cool in here, in uh, where I live in uh, northwest uh, Washington in the United States. Um, so from experience, uh, sometimes bass performance suffers a little bit uh, in these colder temperatures. Uh, uh, so uh, just figured I'd note that uh, usually it's not enough to worry about, but there it is. So we always start with uh, uh, our uh, acoustic measurements that are done with the uh, Clipple uh, Near Field Scanner. This is a high resolution scanner where we measure the speaker about a thousand different points. And using the, you know, all those measurement points around the speaker, we're able to then model an entire radiation pattern for that speaker. So we can then project it at any angle, any frequency, uh, we can figure out what the response is. Uh, those measurements are then extracted using the standardized process uh, by CEA and ANSI called 2034. That says, show me the on-axis response and a few other ones that I'll talk about. But the most important one is the on-axis response. It's in black in here. It's the one that you can see goes up and down. I've drawn a horizontal line, which is an ideal speaker, which would, be, would have no variations. And unfortunately here, we see some variation. This little bit here is not that important, but we see a broad increase in energy from 300 Hertz all the way up to uh, one and a half kilohertz. Then we have a dip. Uh, and then after that is sort of more or less good enough. It would be nice if it didn't go up like this, but uh, 
you know, that's, that's a minor thing. Um, and whenever you see peaking in, in here that's replicated in all the other graphs means there's a resonance, means something, you know, a note that you hit and all of a sudden the, the uh, speaker starts to amplify that on its own more than it should. And those resonances are colorations and sound that we prefer to not see. If it doesn't show up in the other graphs, that means it's just it's just an on axis chance of it being audible is low. But here clearly we see the resonances here, we see them here, we see them here, we see them here. So uh and uh so for sure it's there are resonances. So um instead of going further and analyzing more of this graph. Um, I do another measurement where I take a microphone and the same measurement microphone and I put it very close to each driver and the port and measure that. By doing that, more or less, we exclude the contribution from the other components of a, of a speaker. So without taking it apart, we're able to see what the tweeter is doing, what the woofer is doing, what the port's doing. So here, um, the strong red one is the woofer response and, you know, it handles low frequencies. And then at some point, the crossover and the response of the woofer itself starts to go down. Uh, then it has some breakups that happen up here at very high frequencies, but the amplitude's uh, quite low for it. And then Twitter response is this one in teal or blue, depending on what color you're seeing. Um, on this thing so we can see the crossover more or less here and some resonances close to the high free, at the end of the uh, spectrum. The biggest thing I've noticed is the port though. <clears throat> I put a microphone in front of the uh, one of the holes and measure that. At first we see what ports are supposed to do which is generate a, a lower frequency uh, um, than, than the woofer itself can do. So the woofer response is down but we can see that at this point the port is contributing and is able to flatten the bass response, which is, by the way, quite excellent. Uh, this thing is flat to 60 hertz, which is quite remarkable for a little speaker like this, where you could just pick up with one hand, but you know, it's got flat uh, bass down to 60 hertz. Uh, not just rolled off and responding, but actually flat response, which is pretty good. And then, uh, so going back to this, this is the goodness that the port provides. Unfortunately, inside the uh, cabinet, you can get resonances that are proportional to the uh, dimensions of the uh, speaker, vertical and horizontal and widthwise. And those resonances need to be controlled. Otherwise, basically the speaker is singing in, in those tunes. Uh, if you don't do anything to, to absorb those, they just come out of the hole. Uh, and in this case, the holes are unfortunately are in the front, the ports in the front. So they're quite a bit more audible than if the port was in the back. For some reason, these front ports have become popular because they think somebody's gonna stick these speakers literally into a wall. Nobody does that these days. Uh, just one or two inches of distance from the wall is good enough to let the rear port breathe. So I'd much rather prefer to see a port that's firing backwards because then these things have to first reflect from the wall then come to you and that distance attenuates them uh, whereas if they're in the front they act like basically other speakers that that are spitting out these tones and these this is unfortunately that a lot of times these uh, resonances from a cabin and the port land where the crossover is which means where the speaker is the weakest here we're reducing the output of the woofer for the crossover and then this thing comes in with a you know very you know strong resonance so it actually you can see how it's pushed up the response over here and it does it again over here and it'll do it again over here so it's where the speaker is most vulnerable we have resonances so that's another technique is to try to size the enclosure in the cabinet where these resonance frequencies at least land you know here where they're not where the you know woofer's response gone down so if it's here and it's trying to compete with a stronger output from woofer it has a harder time but when the woofer is rolling down by many db then all of a sudden you have resonance it takes the overall response and and screws it up basically and this is classic coloration you get from a port that's designed this way uh, on this thing. Uh, but there are a lot of good things in here and I'll get to them in a second. But, and one of the things that I'll show you proof of in a second is that this has good directivity, which because of that waveguide that's there in front, the sort of horn looking thing, um, it's able to produce an off axis response that's similar to on axis and that's the goodness we want. The drawback of that is that whatever is wrong with on axis also shows up in off axis. So we see all this coloration over here all 
you know, are there and the trough gets deeper. And so it makes it even worse in here. By the way, companies unique, almost unique in that they have proper measurements for something that's cheap on their website. And they more or less match my measurements. They're very smooth, theirs are, as is typically the case. But overall, they also show, show the dips and the peaks that you, that you see in my response. If you were to use a speaker in far field, meaning for stereo listening as opposed to studio monitoring, um, we have models that predict what the strongest reflections are that combine with direct sound. And then we can create a composite uh, tonality curve for the uh, speaker. If we apply that, we see that it's not very good. Um, we have extra energy in this area, in upper bass and, and uh, mid-range, and then we have a hole in here. Then it actually smooths out and is fine. So uh, this changes the tonality of a lot of stuff in your music and content because, you know, so much is going on in your music here. Not a whole lot going on way out here uh, on this. So uh, there's good engineering in here, but somehow this, this port thing was allowed to happen uh, where it is. Now you can see example of excellence in engineering in, in this beam width. This says that if we pick something like a 6 dB drop off um, as you go off axis, what does that curve look like? And the curve looks beautiful. It's fl almost flat, which is unusual. This is extremely good. We're talking general, like a Neumann kind of uh, professional monitor at far higher prices, they're able to achieve this kind of uh, linearity in, in beam width. Uh, and also means that you can go left and right and the sound will not change much at all. The tonality remains the same, which is important when you work in near field, just slight movement, you're moving a fair amount of angle away from the on-axis response. So you want this kind of you know large beam width and smoothness. Sometimes you get smoothness, but it's very narrow. And so if you go outside of that, all of a sudden it drops like a break. Uh, we can see the same thing color coded in here and you can see how, how pretty it is, how beautiful it is in that it's just very smooth and predictable. And then it narrows at highest frequencies, which is expected. Uh, vertically, it's more chewed up, uh, but that's expected. Uh, basically, the uh, woofer and the tweeter are not concentric and so when you go up and down depending on what distance you go up and down relative to the distance between the center of those two drivers you get cancellations and additions and so forth um so point the speaker at your ear that's how i tested it i have it pointed up in my when i normally test it i didn't test it there and and have it point to your ear and usually your height doesn't change that much but if you stood up you know you will get uh, you know, some of the frequency response that's not very good, you'll run into these holes. So stay within plus and 20, plus or minus 20 degrees and you should be fine. Um, the only solution to that problem is to get a coaxial uh, driver where the center of the tweeter is inside uh, the woofer. And that has its own challenges with power handling, other things, but under activity. But uh, so don't be alarmed with this one being the way it is. I measured distortion at two points, 86 dB SBL and 96. Uh, at 86 dB, response is quite good, other than this one spike in here. So something in there around uh, uh, 300 hertz is, is singing inside there. Whenever you see a distortion profile that's very narrow, usually means the resonance. And you can see it over here also. It doesn't show up uh, that much in the frequency response, but clearly some other thing is starting to sing in there. And therefore, it amplifies harmonic distortions uh, of other tones, lower frequencies, get amplified and show up in here as, as distortion. So uh, I wish that wasn't there, uh, otherwise 86 dB response is very good. 96 dB, that resonance goes through the roof, but also the woofer gets very unhappy. This is very typical uh, of a small speaker like this. Woofer gets unhappy. You have to go way up above the speaker in power handling to not have a woofer uh, get unhappy at 96 dB SBL. Um, so, you know, the woofer is unhappy. Usually, Twitter doesn't get unhappy, and that's what we see in here. But the woofer gets unhappy. Um, detecting distortion at lower frequencies, thankfully, is harder. So, if you're going to have distortion, I'd rather see it here than in the mid frequencies here.
Uh, run a waterfall display and these displays can be very very misleading basically this is frequency response over time and there's so many parameters involved in generating this graph that I can make it look like anything I can make it look like a perfect speaker or I can make it look like it's the worst speaker in the world but i uh, more or less go in the middle and show you something which is in this case anything that sort of hangs on and keeps going uh, is a resonance and we can see these resonances around two or three hundred hertz that we saw in the distortion spike and but also the ones from the port in the cabinet going all the way up to one kilohertz and even beyond in here so you know this just backs up uh it's not needed because we already knew this information anyway um you can see the impulse response actually pretty clean that's one of their claim to fame with the fair filtering and you can also see the step response the sharp one is a twitter and the slow one is the woofer uh you know i i don't usually pay attention to either one of these measurements but some people like to see them so um i when I played the the speaker, um, it wasn't annoying or anything, and it had some signs of excellence in there. Occasionally, I would hear a note and say, "Hmm, that sounds good," but overall, I wasn't getting excited over the sound of it. And but uh, you know, it was hard to put a finger on it, though, and what was wrong. But I had the measurements, so I said, "All right, let me go create filters in Rune Player, which is what I use." And I use a parametric EQ, and what's nice about parametric EQ is that I can design independent filters and then turn them on and off independently, not all or nothing, and see if, if I'm getting better performance or not. And the, the response, if you go back to on-axis response, is really chewed up, so to make a proper correction, you'd have to build a lot of filters in there to fix each one of these things. Excuse me, I took a shortcut and I said, look, I have a hump in here. I want to just put an inverted hump in the EQ. So I just took all of this as if it's continuous and I put one down, an inverse of that in EQ. I have a dip in here, so I assumed that it was just carved out like this and I put an inverted one above. And this thing was going up, so I just put another one going down. I didn't try to match the exact deviation and so forth. So only three filters. Um, so let's go back to that again. Uh, so I've got this filter in here and I've set up the width of it to be quite wide to cover that entire region and then a, a narrower one because that's all that little ditch was and then again this one I just put in um, this will be to taste depending on how much brightness you want and how good your hearing is I tend to not like too much brightness in a speaker so uh, maybe more aggressive here you may be okay with out of box response and not even need this and like I said there's a switch in the back you could also throw that switch and see if that was enough uh, that's enough to get rid of this so th three simple filters in here and uh, when I first dialed them in, to be honest, I was like, okay, that sounds a little bit better. And as I was working on the review, I was listening to it with the filters on. And then after, uh, you know, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I went back and in Rune, you can turn off all the filters at once. And it was dramatic when you turned it off, all of a sudden the sound got a little bit, a little bit more bass, but also became uh, a little bit more, uh, boomy is not the right word, but it just became too much of that upper bass. And because of this ditch in here, because of this, it also sounded less interesting and more close. I uh, find that any deficiency in sort of one to three kilohertz takes away that ambience, that openness that sound can have. And so turning it off was like, oh, I don't want to listen to it. Even though it wasn't terrible, it, 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 it was so dramatic in, in listening to a correct response and then making it broken as opposed to when we first listened to it and I was like, okay, this is a filter. Did it make it better? Did it not? Um, one other beautiful thing about this approach that I use is that one, it confirms the, the measurements to be correct. So in my view, everything that we saw at macro level, at least in the measurements were correct. These corrections definitely made the thing uh, sound better. But you might say, well, that's sighted. You're looking at measurements. Well, you could just close your eyes and, and do these things blind. I often do that where I randomize these, these whether it's on or off, and then I just leave my cursor on it without looking at the uh, UI. I can hit, you know, toggle the switch on and off, on and off, and then decide which one's better than I'd look. And I'd say, okay, did I pick the EQ'd version or non-EQ'd version? And sometimes that happens where I'm like, oh, 
you know, uh, I picked the non-EQ as being better. Then I play some other music, and then it's the other way. When that's the case, I just throw my hands up in the air, and I either don't provide the filters, or I'll tell you that I, I couldn't conclusively decide what the filters were good. In this case, I could, and, uh, you know, obviously it's subjective, and it's my ears and, and not yours, so uh, you can choose to... Uh, go buy them or not and um so overall i thought just a bit of correction was enough uh on this thing um one problem with these active speakers uh, especially at lower price point is is twitter hiss uh because you don't have a passive uh crossover anymore there's nothing to reduce the efficiency and eat up some of that noise and the amplifiers and DSP they tend to use is on the noisy side. You know, it's a hundred fifty dollars speaker. They can't afford to put state of the art uh, technology in there. Um, I've noticed that, for example, JBL LS series, the you know the three hundred five can be the tweeter hiss. You can hear it when it's paused at three to four feet. This one has hiss, but past about seven or eight inches, I couldn't barely hear it. Uh, I do have my computer running, so a little bit of noise is being masked there. But I'd say it's, it's not perfect, but it's definitely on the good side. And at listening distance of three to four feet, five feet, I don't think you're going to hear the uh, the highs even in a, I mean, the noise even in a quiet room. The uh, one other nice thing was the power handling. Um, there is dynamic compression in there that protects the amplifiers and protects the speaker from being overdriven. A uh, lot of superbly designed uh, uh, active speakers have a problem in that as I crank it up, all of a sudden the amplifier runs out of juice and it will crackle, it will create static and or it will also compress. Uh, and for that reason, I don't those speakers. I don't give the highest remarks uh, rewards because it just to me there shouldn't be a technology limitation that all of a sudden hits you in the nose. Um, this one has a nice limiter in it. You turn it up and it gets quite loud, even though I'm listening to just one speaker. And then it gets to a point where you turn it up more and more. It just refuses to get louder. And so it's like a suspension in there. You, there's no hard limit in there. It gets to a point and then it just gradually says, OK, I can't, you know, you told me to go 50 percent louder. I'm only going to go 5 percent um, at this price range. It's great. I couldn't detect any driver bottoming out or the amplifier generating static, which is very, very good. So to me, Oh, many things are done correctly in this RCF uh, Pro 5 speaker. Uh, just the one thing is this front ports, which is fashionable in this industry. And the fact that, you know, at this price range, they probably couldn't afford to put, you know, uh, exotic material in there or better uh, uh, filtering inside or design. They're sort of restricted to where they could put the ports in there. Uh, when they're in the front, whereas when it's in the back, you can move it around to try to minimize some of those effects, go left and right. And uh, But I also think that they could have done better and they can do better because this thing is programmable, it's DSP based. So I've sent them a message asking for feedback and and confirmation to see if they've got the same measurements and they wanted the frequency response that looks the way it does or that their measurements are too rough and they didn't see all the issues that I found and maybe now they can apply a correction i'll let you know what they say i don't know if they'll answer or not but uh, i did contact them because i think it's just too good of a speaker for it to have this one flaw if it didn't have this flaw this would be an incredible speaker yes once you go to 250 300 you can get very nice speakers but 149 and at 149 you're getting uh, two amplifiers you're getting analog digital converter back to that digital to analog because this thing will digitize the input to do the DSP. You're getting DSP correction. Uh, you're getting balanced input. You're getting, you know, proper speaker, only $149 each. So to me, if it didn't have this one issue with the board resonances, this would be just such an incredible value. It would really cement this place at this price level. No way you can match this thing with any kind of passive speaker, you know, that you have to, you know, have add up the cost of the amp and everything else to it. it you're just not going to get an optimized design for $149 that's flat down to 60 hertz. So anyway, um, Came close, came close to being a very, very good speaker, but uh, it, it didn't quite get there. Um, if you go on a forum there, uh, we have other members that do um, 
uh, fully queue based on uh, you know all those troughs and peaks and generate a uh, what we call an olive score for this which i think was around 3.5 3.6 without eq but they jumped up to 5.6 or so with eq so uh, just a bit of eq uh, really lifts the score of the speaker saying that it's more neutral and and good so without eq i think it's fine it sounds okay and maybe good but I really hope somebody who's using this in a desktop environment, uh, like me, if you're doing professional audio work, then you have full control to EQ. Go ahead and, and create one with these just two or three simple filters and have a beautiful speaker. Without it, I'm nebulous as to whether you know you want to use it or not. Um, looking at what the membership voted based on my data, looks like everybody is sort of straddling between not terrible and, and fine, which is, I think, the right rating. Uh, but it could have been fine to great if it came with that EQ built in. Okay, hopefully uh, this was useful to you. And if you're not interested in this speaker as far as measurements and what makes a good speaker and what uh, causes problems for us. Okay, see you in a future one. Bye-bye.